Hello everyone out there. Uh, this is Pastor Tony Galanti coming back again with Prophecy in Christ. Uh, go ahead and uh, hit the like button as well as the, uh, you know, hit the bell as well too and subscribe as well too. Okay, subscribe. You know, this is what I mean by subscribe. Subscribe, okay? Okay, subscribe. And, uh, you know, the button should be on the side there. If you hit that button, you'll, you know, subscribe. And also hit the little bell, okay? Uh, this way, when something new comes up, uh, you'll be alerted to something new, okay? Today, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about a topic that is <clears throat> supposed to be extremely prevalent within the Christian church. And yet, it's very, it's rarely talked about, unfortunately. It's very rarely talked about. And it's, it's, it's really sad that this is not being spoken of. Uh, if I can mention the word, well, the word I'm going to bring out to you, you know, the word you know, the, of the topic is love. A lot of men are threatened by this word, uh, and women too in the church. Sometimes they sexualize it. Everything to them is love is sexualized and because of society. But we're talking about love, biblical love, okay? Love for a brother or sister in Christ. But personally, I mean, first, not personally, but you have, a, have to have a personal love for God first. You know, you know, love God first and he'll guide you properly and you'll love uh, your brother and sister in Christ. I've been in many churches and sometimes I just feel like, you know, I was just talking to my wife the other day and she said a lot of churches, uh, it's prophesied that, uh, you know, people are going to turn cold. And I've seen a lot of that coolness going on today. They'll argue with you about certain certain things. They don't really show you that 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 working together in love. And um, I'm going to show you what the problem is here. I'm, I promise you this. Okay, I'm going to show you what the problem is. And, uh, you know, you've heard love never fails, and it does not fail. Okay, remember that. But you may have loved someone in the church or in your life or what have you, and if you think love failed, but it did not fail. Okay, I'm going to explain that to you right now. Okay, if you're a Christian, this is very important. Okay, okay. Um, I want to go to, I'm going, I'm in chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, and it's 13 verses in this chapter too, I just want you to know, 13, chapter, thir chapter 13 and 13 verses, whoever said 13 was bad luck, you know, it's not always necessarily bad luck, um, you know, let's put superstition aside because I don't believe in superstition, okay, but I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, all 13 verses here, <clears throat> but if you look at the first Three verses in the in the in the um, in chapter thirteen, you'll see things like if I speak with tongues of men and of angels. In other words, uh, I speak a lot about languages and I understand angels and so on. So I, even if I see an angel, you know, you still have to discern the word of God through what you've seen, you know, in a vision or what have you. If you if you claim to have one, all right, uh, you got to go take everything through the word of God here, okay. Uh, and I'm not a person who thinks, well, you have a vision every day, and I'm not a person who necessarily has had a vision, <laughs> but uh, I've heard of people claiming it, you know, uh, and sometimes I wonder myself. But, and then it goes on in chapter, I mean, excuse, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 2, and if I have the gift of prophecy and know all the mysteries, know all mysteries and all knowledge, um, and have faith so that, you know, as to remove mountains, I'm paraphrasing this as looking at this, because I'm trying to get to the main verses here in this. But do not have love, I am nothing. Okay? What Paul is saying here is this. You can have a ton of knowledge, you can have, uh, you can have the gift of prophecy, and the gift of prophecy is a truth-driven, very truth-driven spiritual gift. If you go to the next chapter, chapter 14 in 1 Corinthians, that talks about prophecy being the superior gift. And but he said, but Paul has always told us, even people with the other gifts are not, you know, everything is important. The whole, everyone's important to, the, to God. When God looks at us, he looks at us all the same. Okay. Uh, because let's face it, Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood, you know, and resurrected from the dead. You know, died on the cross, shed his blood, you know, resurrected from the dead for all of us not just for those people who are driven to truth. We're supposed to all drive for truth, and I can promise you that. If your spiritual gift is service or giving 
or um, ruling or teaching uh, or encouragement or exhortation is really, it's a di little different than encouragement. Or prophecy, we're all supposed to be driving for the truth of the word of God. All of us. And other things too. You can see that in Romans um, chapter 12. And that is how you fulfill the will of God for your life. That's the main thing. Use your spiritual gifts in love for Christ. See? Okay. But I'm going to get to this. <clears throat> Um, and then Paul goes on and says this, too. He says, uh, <clears throat> And if I give all my possessions and feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burnt or, you know, cremated, per se, right? But I don't have love, I profit nothing, okay? In other words, <clears throat> there are some people who say, I don't want to be a pest, I don't want to be, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I'll give everything to the poor and I'll do that. And these are works, but... God doesn't want automatics. He doesn't want robots out there. Like, this is what God says, and this, and you're really grudgingly doing this. I'm going to give you an example, okay? Back in the 60s and 70s, I've heard of people going to missionary trips in other continents, okay? Maybe even in the 40s, too. And uh, <clears throat> let's say they went to Africa, and they didn't have tea or coffee, right? Let's just say tea for that matter. I have heard literally that people would, in America, use a tea bag, okay, dry the tea bag out, and send the used tea bag to Africa. So the missionaries can have tea. Well, you know, that's not taking care of our missionaries. That was really, I mean, unless you're dirt poor, then it's a different story. I could see that. But if you can buy tea, you should be able to send them a whole box and not use it, not even use one, you know, per se. Uh, you know, it's an action possibly without, a you know, the decency of a, having a loving heart in the whole thing. That's an action there. And I've also heard of this other thing, too. When we look at other Christians or other Christians look at us, some people out there think they have a license to be a fruit inspector. Okay. We don't have the license to be fruit inspectors. We know if somebody sins, it's one thing. If somebody does not sin, it's another thing. But if we're going to be snooping around and being suspicious about old things, and, you know, that's just... And, you know, when you look at a piece of fruit on the outside, right? I've seen these things, two, both sides of the coin. You look at a piece of fruit, um, all right, on the outside, and what happens is you, um, you cut it. Well, some people take a bite out of it. Let's say it's an apple, right? And the outside looks perfect, but the inside is rotten. And you've got to get rid of it because it's rotten. It's a rotten apple, okay? On the other hand, too, I'm going to tell you another story. My grandfather, when I was growing up, he was a gardener. He liked, he liked to garden. That was his little hobby. He loved flowers and, and, and fruits and, and vegetables. He grew everything, right? He had a, 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 a peach tree in the backyard, right? And... <laughs> he was a real old timer and he was a, you know, strong, decent man, you know, and uh, these peaches would grow on this tree. And when he picked the peaches off, they didn't look like every other peach. You know, some peaches, the peaches we get are really big like this. Well, his peaches were about that big, you know, not, not terrifically large in size. I'm sorry, these glasses are annoying me tonight. Um, but they had little spots on them, on, on the skin, little spots. And people in today's day and age, today's society, would throw that away and say, oh, it's rotten, it's got bugs in it. He would eat those peaches, and he was not eating bugs or anything like that. What he did was he peeled the skin off, and once the skin was off, the peach was perfect inside. So it wasn't rotten, it was just that it was a blemish on the outside of the peach. So, you see... Some people who want to be fruit inspectors can look at the outside. If it's got spots on it, they'll, put, they'll throw it away. But what happens is if you look at the nice, clean apple on the outside, take a bite, it could be rotten on the inside. So what I'm, I'm trying to equate this with love, all right, this love thing here, okay? Because that's what Paul's talking about in his 13th chapter, okay? That's the threatening word to men. 
because they they twist it around. Society's twisted around so much, and women too have twisted around too. But I'm going to get down to the point of what biblical love really is. Okay, okay. Now it's the Apostle Paul says here in verse four of chapter thirteen. It says, "Love is patient, love is kind, and it is not jealous." Love does not brag and is not arrogant, okay? Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Does not take into account the wrong suffered, okay? Okay. All right. That's, so what's Paul saying here, basically, okay? Love is patient. Now, <clears throat> It doesn't mean you go on, you see something wrong, and you just let it go, and over and over and over. You gotta, you gotta stand up to what's right. You see, but there's only one thing that you test that whatever you see, whatever you're experiencing against it. And let me explain something to you. You see this kind of love here? Love is patient. Love is kind, and so on and so forth. If you're a Christian, the greatest strength you have is to know the kind of love that God has for you. Of course, we talk about the love of Jesus and what God did for us. He shed his blood on the cross for us and so on and so forth and forgave us, forgave us of sins. He justified us He wrote when he rose from the dead. And that's showing us love. But you can go to your heavenly father anytime and speak to him and speak, you know, and you could speak to Jesus, the Holy Spirit. But, you know, it's better to just go to, the whole, to God and just say, look, this is what's on my heart, Lord. Okay. And you can go boldly. Okay, now, the idea here is this, you and I have to put this kind of love in our heart, because this is the kind of love, if we have this kind of love in our heart, we are so strong and so powerful for any attack, you know, sometimes people can feel guilt, to try to, sometimes people try to guilt you out, or try to make you feel like something's not right, and only God knows every little detail. They don't know every detail. Other people don't know every detail of what's happened or what's going to happen. Only God knows what you're going through, okay? And you have to still check that against something else. And I'm going to get to that part too. But you see, that is your greatest power, is to know how God loves you. He's not the kind of God who's impatient. He's not the kind of God who's not kind, okay? He's not the kind of guy who's jealous. He's a jealous God. Of course, he doesn't want you to, you know, believe in other gods or worship other gods. That's, that's, but jealousy can cause a lot of trouble in, in a relationship. It's really a very sick thing to be jealous. Uh, I've seen disasters because of jealousy, okay? It's really not good. Of course, a husband and wife, they have a natural jealousy. They don't want... A spouse to be driven away by somebody else, you know, that's normal. But you see, and then love does not brag. Now, bragging is basically saying, I'm better than you, I'm greater than you, I, I'm smarter than you, you know, it, it's not saying, I'm not, that's bragging. But if you're, you're, if you're an individual, an intelligent individual, and you're not afraid to express it, do it, okay? If you have any other kind of talent or ability or gift, you can speak about it, you're not bragging, okay? Is a, but where's the heart in the whole thing? The heart. If you have a piece of knowledge, right? A piece of knowledge. And you want to offer peop, people knowledge, right? And you want to help them fix a problem or benefit from your problem. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're trying to act like a smart aleck and say, well, I know all this stuff and you're a dumbbell, that's not good. And to, to attack a person back when they're trying to do something right in a sincere manner, and I mean, sincerity is very important. Integrity and sincerity is very important in the Christian faith. Okay? Integrity means you're going to be the way the Scripture teaches you. And you're going to stand on your two feet with it, no matter what. Okay? I don't care if the whole world turns against you. The blood of Christ is the most important thing. You stand on that. Okay? That's, that's integrity. Okay? Okay? But sincerity is another word. Sincerity is a word that we get from, I believe, the Latin language. Uh, and it's kind of a funny word when you really think of it, the history of it. 
Um, the emperors, they would make a statue of, of a Roman emperor, right? And um, when a uh, an emperor got killed off, some other emperor killed him off, right? They would take the head off and put another head on that statue, right? Uh, because of the sincere, the sear, the searing of it, the cutting off of the head, putting another one on, all right? That was not sincere, but a, a sincere statue of these emperors meant it never got cut off. There was no break. Okay, sin or sen. This was where we get the word sin. Um, we get the word sincerity from, and we also get the word um, sanity from. All right, which which means without, no break. There's no break in the statue. You know, let's say the neck or whatever. So that was considered a sincere statue, okay? So, so let me go on from here, okay? All right. <clears throat> uh, okay, it doesn't brag, it's not arrogant, you know. Uh, arrogance is when something is truthful, when somebody's trying to help someone and they just want to ignore it or they want to attack you back. There's something out of the whack in their brain. What can I say? You know, they're... they're they're out of their mind or something else is bugging them or they have a very strong insecurity problem within them. And that's why they attack. That's what psychology says. To me, it's a sin problem. It's an evil problem. Okay. Um, you know, like, like, like it says it back in, I think it's uh, John 8, you know, you know, if sometimes arrogant people will lie to lie through their teeth, uh, jealous people lie through their teeth. And what Jesus says is these these people are driven by the father of lies, which is the devil himself, you know? I mean, this is just not right to do such a thing, okay? So, let's go on from here. Um, I wanted to tell you, I want to tell you this too. Okay, it says here, it does not act unbecomingly, all right? In other words, it's not, how do I say, it's not trying to uh, trigger off something that shouldn't be triggered off, all right? Uh, you know, sometimes uh, there's a flirtatious situation and they're acting kind of unbecoming and it's not right. And if they're trying to pull people away from their current situation, it's not correct, okay? They they, they should be normal, straight, de decent people, you know? Um, okay. Uh, it says here also, uh, it does not seek its own, okay? So in other words... You're not always seeking your own glory. You're not always seeking your own finance. You're trying to be benevolent. Okay, benevolent is very important. I personally like to give, if a person has an in, a problem or and there's um, I have some information to give them. I will be benevolent with them. You know, um, I've talked to a lot of people. I'll give you an example. One example. Okay, if you have a vitamin D deficiency, and most people do, okay, in this country. <clears throat> Um, the doctors will tell you to take a thousand units a day you know, and that, and you'll go back and they'll say, no, it hasn't worked. And you'll take more and you take more and it doesn't work. The problem is if you don't have enough magnesium in your diet, you will not absorb vitamin D. Okay. So what I tell people is when I, when, if they mention me, you know, my vitamin D is low. I tell them, look, what you need to understand is the vitamin D is vitamin D. You need it. Okay. But the best, the only way to really truly absorb it is if you have uh, magnesium with it or magne more magnesium in your diet. You're probably deficient in magnesium. If you're deficient in magnesium, you're not going to absorb it. Okay, that's the truth. Okay. So what I'm trying to say here is this, and this is how I explain it to people. Um, if you have a vitamin D deficiency, let's say that's the engine of the car, all right? And you have no transmission, which is the magnesium. You're not going to go anywhere with it. You can take all the vitamin D you want, right? I'm just kind of switching things back and forth here, analogies here. And uh, that's how you absorb more, more vitamin D, if you increase your magnesium. Because the soil we have in our, because of our, our, our country, we fertilize and re-fertilize, we don't replace the magnesium as much. So we actually need to have more magnesium. You get it through supplementation or what have you, okay? That kind of good stuff. <clears throat> but I'm not going to get into that because I, you know, that's another side of my life that I, I'm heavily into is supplements too. But anyhow, I wanted to give you that example, okay? Being benevolent, okay? 
having a decent heart to help someone else. Okay, trying to help. Um, the other thing is, um, okay, it's not arrogant. Okay, uh, it's not provoked. Okay, well, you know, there's a certain time where provocation ends. People can provoke you and provoke you and provoke you and provoke you, and uh, there's a time where that's got to end. You got to take it. You got to take an action. It's ended. It's over with. Even Paul uh, rebuked a uh, a girl, you know, uh, in the book of Acts, because she had a spirit in her, and because uh, she was kept, she kept on provoking him, you know, uh, in a spiritual in a spiritual battle, and he got rid of that evil spirit, and the whole place was ticked off at Paul because. That was a major income for her, you know. She was kind of on the uh, witchy side, if I could say that. And uh, she was giving forth uh, like a fortune-telling mentality. Uh, and stay away from that kind of stuff, incidentally, too, because that's evil stuff. Uh, but stay away. And, and uh, what happened, basically, was, uh, you know, uh, the whole city was in an uproar because of what Paul did. Too bad, you know. I'm pretty much paraphrasing that situation, but it's in the Book of Acts. You could look at it. But anyhow... Uh, you know, it also says it's long. Your person is long suffering. That's the kind of love, you know. And long suffering mean, basically means patience too. You know, uh, not a person who. Well, give me for instance, okay, a man and a wife. They get married. The wife gets sick. Okay. Well, okay. So the husband's got to do extra work, extra to maybe help the kids out more or whatever. He's got to do more, or vice versa too. You know, sometimes the wife. So, excuse me. They're suffering, one suffering. Some men today will turn around literally, or women, will turn around and literally and leave that spouse because of their illness. But you stand up and you fight for that spouse. That's your, that's your Christian way. Okay? Now, the other thing I wanted to tell you, this is, this is the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm leading to right now. The big clue behind it is, see... This is the love of God. This is what God, how God loves us and how we're supposed to love one another. And the word love there means a brotherly type love, okay? And a benevolence, a real warmth of love for one another. And I haven't seen much of this in churches today. I'm really sorry to say that. And, you know, some people would say, well, maybe you have a problem. I don't have the problem. I'm going to tell you why. Because I'm looking for it. I'm looking for love. Because I want to give. I'm, I'm trying to give. I've seen it. In certain churches, and they were wonderful, really wonderful. But there's so many churches out there where everything is so mechanical. You go, you worship, uh, you, you know, uh, you hear the word of God, and sometimes I don't even mention the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ or the word sin or anything. Else. And they pack their bags and go home, and they think they had church. Well, okay, or they worshiped. This word, worshiped, worship, worship. But nobody's learning anything from the scripture. What is going on in this country? Open our eyes to the Word of God. This is the clue, okay? And some churches are so ceremonial that you don't even know what's going on, which is not good either, okay? But look at what verse the next verse says here, okay? Okay, it says here, it bears all things, endures all things, okay? But previous, okay, verse 6 says this about the love, love okay, it does does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Okay, so how do you, you know, if somebody's doing something wrong, you don't encourage it. You discourage that kind of stuff. Or you rebuke it. Or you, you know, you you you, you reproof that person. And some people say, I want to be unconditionally loved. Well, or, or they think that the church is supposed to be unconditionally lovable to them. When they're doing something absolutely wrong. They're lying. They lie. They Some people lie. Some people are pull, playing political games. Lots of pull, politics going on. It's wrong. Very, very, very wrong. Okay? There's no righteousness in that. It's very unrighteous. You know me, and I'm your buddy. And you know, let me tell you something about the old, the old, the, the, the churches in the uh, New Testament, okay? There were slaves. And there were owners or masters, per se, of those slaves, right? If a person was extremely gifted, or I mean, if a person was gifted by the Holy Spirit, 
let's say with the gift of prophecy or preaching or teaching or what have you, okay, and they were a slave, believe it or not, they would be teaching their masters about the faith. You understand what that means? That's really the truth. So that's the impartiality that we all need to have. Okay? Okay. Well, let me get to the next verse here. I mean, the, the, the same verse, sorry. Unrighteousness. But rejoices with the truth. Okay? The rejoicing with the truth is extremely important. We need to know God's word. We need to be rejoicing with the truth. Lots of times, you're going to, I've gone into churches and I've talked to people about the scripture. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, and these are people who've gone to church for many years. And where is their knowledge in the scripture? Everything today, a lot of things in, in America today are activities and more activities and more activities for the teens and the wives and the husbands and all separate. What's going on in this country? This is crazy stuff. We need to have our, our nose in the book and we need to be sharing in a benevolent, loving way one another because this is the way Christ wanted it to be and wants it to be. And you know what happens? We're all a body. We're supposed to be working together. You know, like a body of, we're made of 30 trillion cells. Our body has to work together. If they go out of whack, something's wrong. We get sick, we're ill. You know, something else, even worse, like cancer, God forbid. We got to stop this kind of thing. We need to be working together as a body of believers, okay, in America. And, you know, this is why I wrote this book. And we need to do it for the truth. See, truth and love go hand in hand. See, you can say, I love, I love, I love, I love, I love. But if there's lack of truth and you're lying to people, or you're not telling the truth, or you don't care about the truth and you just love, you're living a lie. It's wrong. But this is why I wrote this book. So you could learn the major truths of the scripture. I mean, it goes through every single thing. It's called raw Christianity, the way Jesus Christ expects us all to know it, for the Christian, the non-Christian, and even the skeptic. And why do I even say for the non-Christian, uh, for, for the Christian and the non-Christian? I'll tell you something. Sometimes I've seen, I've talked to people about Christianity, and sometimes people who claim to be unbelievers know a little bit more than some believers, which is a real strange thing when you think of it. So people are going through the motions and not really learning the Word of God and applying it. You have to apply things. Read a chapter of Scripture and ask God, what, I ask the Holy Spirit, what do I do? What are you telling me to do through your Word? What do you want me to learn? How do I apply it? You know? Um, Jesus even says, love your enemies. But you know what that means? You have an enemy, let's say, and you see them in the street and they're bleeding to death. You help them out. After that situation, you get them possibly in an ambulance or what have you, and they're off. You, you could go visit them a little bit if you want. You could send them something if you want. But after that, if they're still that, that, that way, you just pack your bags and take off. Because you know what? You've tried to help. You love them. You help them out. But if they still don't like you, that's their problem. See? So, and remember this. You know, Paul said, Paul goes on here in the next verses. He said, we know these things in part, you know, for, for like prophecy and the mysteries of the Scripture. But we need to learn the Scripture in the doctrinal sense. Like, that's what this is for. The, the docu doctrinal sense means the doctrines are in this book, okay? And we all, we all need to know them. And I'm telling you, and I'm going to say this to you again. If you get this book, you're going to know more than most pastors I've seen in America, okay? So, get this book, Raw Christianity, the way Jesus Christ expects us all to know it. It's Zulon Press is the publisher, and my name is Tony Galanti, G-A-L-A-N-T-E, okay? I've been... Uh, ordained for, for, oh gosh, probably about 30-something 30, 30 years so far. I'm, I don't know. Uh, it's been a while. <laughs> but, um, you know, the idea here is make sure when you love and are benevolent, you do it through the truth. Okay? You don't have to talk about your pickup truck and about how you cook. and you know, That's not church. That's not Christianity. Talk about a Bible verse that was helped you out or showed you something. 
And you know, some people are going to try to come back at you and compete with you, and that's wrong too. So if they do that, you know, go to the side, go find somebody else. But try to start sharing scripture with each other, okay? Because uh, it really comes down to love, okay? And love is so important, you know, uh, in the last verse of chapter 13. Uh, but now abide in faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love, okay? Now, let me tell you what faith means, okay? Faith means we absolutely, this is faith in the Word of God. If you say you have faith in God, you have to know this book. You have to study this book in faith. That's what your faith is in this book. Jesus Christ is called the Word, John 1, 1, okay? Now, the word hope is a different word. A lot of people don't. It, hope is not a gamble. Like, I hope this is going to happen. You know, people take gambles and they hope they're going to win this and win that, win the lottery or whatever, you know, this wasting money stuff. The word for hope in the Bible is an absolute, it will take place. Like the second coming of Christ is going to take place. That's an absolute. You can use the word hope even be, I'm going to, I, I know in, in the sense of hope, I'm going to be with the Lord because it's an absolute word. I'm going to be with the Lord when I when I die because I've accepted Christ. You have to have that boldness to be able to understand what it really means to have the faith in Christ. But remember, it's love. Love is the eternal one. Because when everything is gone from this world, love is going to be the only thing that's going to really truly last. Because God is love. Okay? But you have to love God in truth. Because he's also truth. Okay? He's the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of love. Okay, And this is prophecy, because the Spirit of Christ is a spirit of prophecy. All right? Okay, I'm going to let you go now. Lord bless you. Uh, again, hit the like button, um, you know, and uh, subscribe. Hit that subscribe button down there, okay? And um, hit the little bell. This way, when uh, when a new, a new uh, video comes out, you'll get... Uh, notified, okay? Lord bless you, and uh, just keep going for the Lord. Remember, it's the Word of God in your life that's first, okay? That's how we get to know who God is. Prayer, getting to know who God is, loving God, you know, realizing what He's done for us. If we don't study the Word of God, we don't have a relationship with God, okay? I've heard people say, well, I don't have to have your book, you know, I've heard people say, you know, it's a relationship. No, you have to know who he is first. If you don't know who he is, you're from this book. You're in trouble. If I have a key to my house and I show you my key, you can't tell me what kind of sofas I have in my living room, how big my living room is, what my kitchen looks like. You don't have by the key. Okay, You have to have the keys to get in. Opening this book, the Bible, reading it, getting into it, Knowing the doctrines of the Bible, so, you know, my, that's why I wrote this book, then you'll have a very powerful relationship with God. You can't have some flippant thing, okay? We can't have a relationship with God like the skin on top of water. Do you ever fill up a glass of water that's so, th it's about to drip over, but there's like a little skin on it, on the top? We don't want that kind of relationship with God, that little skin, okay? We want to dive deep into the, into the water. And this is the word of God, okay? Jesus is called the living word. He's also the living water. Okay. okay. Lord bless you. Take care. Bye-bye now. Okay. Have a great week.